include music from the decades that the RHY program uh, encompasses, how many of you will be dancing this evening? Uh, now that's, that's way too few hands. So if, if I'm going to get out there and dance, I expect at least 50% of you will as well. All right, we'll see how that goes. We'll get into the more uh, important converse, conversation now. So uh, Mark Greenberg mentioned this morning the notice for proposed rulemaking. Um, I know many of you submitted comments either individually or through advocacy organizations as a collective. Uh, he indicated that there were 72 submissions that ranged anywhere from a 25-page set of questions and comments to single comments of, it looks great, thanks. Um, of the individual comments and questions that we received, uh, they were well over 300 items that we had to address. Uh, and as you can imagine, 300 individual questions spanning a wide variety of topics associated with the Runaway and Homeless Youth Program. It took a little while for us to cross-reference, read, respond to, and so where we are right now is that the documents is done in draft and it's on its way up the chain in the federal government, uh, internal to ACF, HHS, ultimately to Office of Management and Budget for their blessing. Uh, and we anticipate, assuming that all goes well and everybody in the food chain agrees with our proposed responses and our final rule draft, that we will publish sometime in 2015. Here's the catch, though. We also know that Runaway and Homeless Youth Act is up for reauthorization. And if it passes, which we all want it to, obviously it's an important law that has a dramatic impact on our, all of our lives and the children and youth that we serve, we have to start the process all over again. Um, so uh, as much work has been done, uh, if the new law goes into effect, we have a lot more work to do and you will all be given another opportunity to provide those comments and questions. Um, just so you understand, there were some real tangible themes in the comments that we received. Some were very strong opinions, uh, which was good. We needed to hear that feedback. Uh, but background checks was something that we received a lot of feedback about. Uh, we received a lot of feedback about the, the notion of safe and appropriate exits. Uh, and, and I can't give you specific details because nothing is final until it's cleared by the secretary at HHS to say, yes, this is the new rule. But what I can tell you is that we tried not only to address what a safe, appropriate, what, what a safe and appropriate exit isn't, but also what it is. Uh, because there's also an element to the rule that talks about performance measures. And I know that is uh, a point of anxiety for a lot of folks, particularly around the numbers that we proposed in the, the draft rule uh, and that you all commented on. So we listened. Uh, we paid close attention to the things that you had to say, and uh, I want to make sure that you know that we, we paid attention to those comments and we just didn't go off on our own and make decisions. Um, clicker. There we go. Um, we get a lot of feedback about funding announcements. Um, not, of it, not all of it is good. <laughs> uh, there is a tremendous amount of consternation amongst grantees uh, around the decision-making process uh, for who does and who does not receive a grant. Um, the reality of it is, is that the pie is only so big, and we have to cut it up in such a way that we feel is fair and equitable. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that means that some folks who had been funded in the past don't get refunded. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a piece of grant making that you can't get away from. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do to mitigate that situation is to rewrite our funding opportunity announcements. Um, I've been with FISB for just over 10 months. I came from the Department of Justice where I was in the Office of Justice Programs for about 15 years in a grant-making agency, working on juvenile justice issues and victims of crime issues. And, and we had the same problems there. 
where uh, organizations that applied for funds were disappointed when they weren't selected and they didn't feel that the evaluation of their applications necessarily reflected what they submitted. Uh, ultimately though, what we had to work hard at and what we're now working hard at here in FISB is to rewrite a FOA, a funding opportunity announcement, that gives you the opportunity to tell us what your organization can do and demonstrate to us in the writing that you know best what needs to be done in your community. As opposed to the way that some of the FOAs have been written in the past where maybe it looks more like a checklist. If I say all the right things, then I'm gonna get the top score. That's not fair to you all because what it does is it sets up a situation where you're competing for points, differences that are quite minimal. And so um, I'm, I'm, I, if I had a pom-poms and a flag and you know the yellow cones that they use to guide the airplanes in to, to wave around, to say, please pay attention to the basic center program and the street outreach program funding opportunity announcements in fiscal year 2015, because they will be different. And, and I don't want your organizations to find themselves in a situation where you're writing to the same FOA that you all have for years, and then you're not responding to the one that you really need to respond to. So that, that's the important takeaway from that this statement. Uh, most importantly, uh, again, is evaluation criteria is being rewritten so that it focuses on you articulating the demonstrated need and really your organizational capacity and ability to address the issue. All right, 2014 domestic trafficking efforts. Been a lot of conversation about trafficking. Um, I've made this statement to smaller audiences in the past year as I've traveled and visited regional offices. Uh, I know that it was suggested earlier by one of the questions that were posed to you. Trafficking is just a name for something that you have already been doing and dealing with for a long period of time. I know that working in the juvenile justice field as long as I did and working in the victim service field as long as I did. It doesn't come as a surprise to me coming into the runaway and homeless youth field that you've all been involved in dealing with quote unquote trafficking victims. Uh, it's just a term of art that we've picked up because the statute says this is how we're going to define this type of victimization as trafficking. What we do know about the efforts that you've had in place over the years, and this is uh, feedback we got from a survey that RITAC put out uh, for 2013 to 2014, is that an overwhelming majority of you have worked with young people who have either been trafficked sexually or who have been labor trafficked. The numbers don't lie, it just corroborates what we already know. Um, but more importantly, what that survey articulated back to us is what your needs are. And, and what I've heard over the past day or so, as well as in a street outreach program meeting that I attended several months back, is that you need resources. You need training in, in how to address the issues of these young people more, most appropriately, uh, as well as you need tools at your disposal whether it's, it's a physical piece of paper or whether it's a number to call or it's a resource in your community to say, hey, I've got this kid that I don't know what to do with. How do I best handle them? Those are all things that you're looking for and we're working on it. We're, we're trying to get that stuff out to you because we wanna make sure that you're poised to be able to appropriately respond to a trafficking victim, recognizing that they really do take up a tremendous amount of resources in a program that doesn't necessarily have a tremendous amount of resources as it's at its disposal already. And so uh, I, I don't wanna say the cavalry is coming. Um, what I can say is that we're on the slow chuck wagon to delivering you the necessary resources to, to start helping you address the issue a little bit more broadly. So. All right, real quickly, and I'm the gatekeeper to the next speaker, so that means you can get on and go about the evening. Uh, this is a broad conversation. Th th this goes well beyond um, here in this room with runaway and homeless youth providers. I've been in the government for 15 years. 
I started working on trafficking issues at the Office of Juvenile Justice back in 1998-1999, telling people then, kids who are in the juvenile justice system are victims, we just don't call them what we call them now. So uh, the federal government's kind of caught up, and uh, Congress feels the need to embrace this issue, and we're going to take full advantage of that embracing and ask them for the resources and the material and the necessary, uh, necessary strategies to get this work done. And so part of that is the Federal Strategic Action Plan that Mark talked about a little bit this morning. Uh, it really is a 257-point plan that if you have light reading you're looking to do one evening, uh, I would encourage you to pull it up because it goes into the granular detail of what every federal agency in the U.S. government, from the FBI to the Immigration and Customs Enforcement to HHS to DOJ, Department of Ed, they all have a role. And it truly is uh, an impressive thing when, when we filter down to the ACF level and to the FISB level, we also have a lot of uh, responsibility uh, for things that we need to focus our efforts on. And, and so we talked a little bit about the SOP study. That type of research is going to continue to drive our efforts. Uh, we have given money to RITAC to be able to provide resources for you. We're going to continue to put out the necessary resources in funding if it becomes available. Uh, and uh, I think the demonstration program that you heard about earlier from Mark today where we've picked the three communities. And I'm not going to read the slides to you. Uh, what I want you to take away from these slides is that we picked three service providers that represent the three areas that we feel are going to be the most comprehensive to addressing this issue. That's runaway and homeless youth vis-a-vis -vis tumbleweed. Um, uh, we've picked a domestic violence program in New York City um, in the Edwin Gould Center. And then we've picked a traditional trafficking organization who deals primarily with foreign victims, those victims that we, we, we usually think of when we think of human trafficking. Um, massage parlors, maybe brought in from a foreign country. Uh, all three of those organizations are going to have to work together to determine how they're going to provide services in their communities for all the potential victims that they may come in contact with who are domestic victims. Those are U.S. citizens or lawful permanent residents. So as uh, the RHY program here in Phoenix, Tumbleweed, who would probably very much like to just deal with youth, are now going to have to develop strategies to figure out how they're going to handle 50-year-old immigrants who are here legally but are forced to work in a Chinese restaurant. Now, you're looking at me quizzically. Like, what in the world are you asking them to do? The reason is that the law that we're following, the Tra Trafficking Victims Protection Act, the, the particular section that we're using, doesn't allow us to limit the focus of the program. But the important thing here is that it's coordinated case management and direction toward appropriate services. So if they do, in fact, through their outreach efforts, come across a victim that meets that uh, demographic, they've got to know who to refer that person to. That doesn't mean that they're going to take their resources and provide them with a, a bed or they're going to give them food, but they have to know who in the community is now best suited to address the needs of that victim. And I don't think that that necessarily exists. I think what you end up having, having is organizations that stovepipe themselves. We do trafficking victims from Southeast Asia. That's all we focus on. If we see an 18-year-old or a 17-year-old uh, African-American or, or white female who was picked up on the street corner, we can't help her. We, we don't know what to do. That's not an appropriate response for these service providers. They have to be able to say, look, we've talked to the local advocacy organizations, domestic violence, sexual assault, culturally appropriate services, so that we at least know where to send this person where we didn't have that conversation before. So that's, that's the path that we're taking because we know that coordinated case management works and it's necessary. And, and so that's the theme of our domestic trafficking programs. And then lastly, 
And I'll leave this up uh, just for a few minutes as we transition to Bill. Um, we've got some very specific outcomes that we want these service providers to be able to accomplish. And that's about assessing need, that's about finding appropriate services, that's making sure that the victims uh, that they're giving those services to are in fact getting what they need. You can give a person a service, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the appropriate service. Uh, so it's a, it's a list that um, we think is extensive enough to give us the outcomes that we're looking for in the hopes that we have the ability to expand the program. We're also doing an evaluation to make sure that this is the best way to go forward. Uh, all right, I'm done. I'm going to pass it on to Bill and I look forward to seeing you all on the dance floor. Good afternoon, everyone. Anybody, anybody interested in funding? Yeah. Not too many people. Anybody interested in funding? Yeah. Hope I do this right. Which one is it? Non-continuation funding. Those are not typos. We are going to get the notices out early this year for your non-continuation funding. They're going out January 6th, and they're all going to be due March 6th. So we get them in, we get them um, processed, and we have you ready to go when your start date begins. So we're going to move quickly. But to do it quickly, we have some helpful, helpful hints for you. One, anybody here know of Grant Solutions? If you don't know of Grant Solutions, that's okay. Go back to your office and remind the, your executive directors um, that there is Grant Solutions and they will receive a notice on continuations in the mail and through Grant Solutions. Don't forget to look at those emails that come from Grant Solutions. But a couple of quick things on, on this. Use the online forms. The online forms the, for 424-424-A make life a lot easier for us, for you, and for OGM, Office of Grants Management, um, because it increases efficiency, reduces errors, and please just avoid the PDF versions. It just makes, uh, it just slows down the process and we want to get money to you quickly. Make sure your program reflects the original approved grant. If you make any changes, please talk to your project officer beforehand. Those, uh, those changes need to be discussed beforehand before we move on with your, um, with your continuation grant. Um, dollar amounts on your line item budget, your budget narrative, your 424 and 424A must match. If they don't, grants management is going to send you a little email. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not used to using Sorry about that. Um, the, and so your, for, so your budgets, everything needs to match. Please make sure they match. Um, if they don't match, your application will be delayed. The other thing is to use whole dollars. The federal government doesn't like change for some reason. So we use whole dollars in our, grant, in, in our continuation notices. So, you know, I've seen some where they round it off to certain, you know, they they extend a dollar out and it comes out to 25 cents, you know, just round it up or down, please. Makes it a lot easier and you don't get a notice that you have to redo it. The next thing I'm here to talk to you about is the 40th anniversary PSA. In order to keep up the momentum to end homeless, homelessness, uh, FISB has uh, proposed to create a 30 second public service announcement to raise awareness about homelessness, encourage the public to join in the process of ending homelessness. We are anticipating and we are hopeful that Cindy Lauper will participate in this venture um, with us in the P PSA and that we are hoping that we will get approval for the PSA and be able to roll it out sometime by the end of the year or right after. So that will be coming out also. Um, I will pass it on to, to, G to Jen to Jen. Hey, everyone. 
My name is Jen Rich. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of the National Clearinghouse on Families and Youth. How many of you know what the National Clearinghouse on Families and Youth is? Excellent. Actually, fewer hands this year than last year, so you might have to get my long spiel. Um, actually, the National Clearinghouse on Families and Youth is FISB's um, information service. We're fully funded by FISB to meet your communicate and their communication needs. So um, I won't go into the whole spiel because I know we're short on time. But um, there were a couple things this year that we did that were that I thought were really special and great, and I wanted to talk to you about them a little bit. And I thought it'd be really fun because everybody loves a pop quiz to do it in the form of a pop quiz. So if you look on the screen, can, you, can any of you tell me what the new Nickfee logo is? Anybody have a different answer? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so at the beginning, um, about a year ago when uh, Associate Commissioner Bill Bentley came on board, he sort of um, encouraged everybody to build some momentum and increase the visibility of the, not only the RHY program, but also FISB. And um, one of the things that we've done over the past year was rebrand the Family and Youth Services Bureau. And I know that sounds kind of, you know, marketing-y and stuff, but what that really means is um, FISB decided that, um, that, uh, sorry, I was just looking at my answer. FISB decided that, um, that we needed to come together behind a sort of a vision of, of what the impact is of these programs. And so they put together a, a logo, a new logo that is, um, that was designed to, sh to sh uh, show the strength of the Family News Services Bureau and the work that you all do. And as part of that, so you'll, you'll notice actually in, it's um, all over all of the materials that are here today. RITAC did an amazing job of deploying the new branding of the Family News Services Bureau. So, um, everywhere. But anyway, one of the things that they also decided was that there is this, FISB dollars fund so many things around the country, including your programs. And there was no real good way to show the world the impact of those dollars and to show that we're a community and we're all working together um, to end youth homelessness. So in the, in the uh, course of the branding, what they put together was a seal, which you'll see on the bottom here. And what that seal, it says a Family and Youth Services Bureau supported program. Um, so what FISB is asking you, you all to do is to, through your project officers, who will have the information on how to deploy that seal, is to start using it on your websites, everywhere, um, to sort of show that we are a community and that we're all working together and this is all our collective effort to end youth homelessness. Um, by the way, the answer was A. <laughs> on, that, on that one. So the Nick, Nick Fee, obviously, RITAC and Nick Fee, and all of the other things that are, that are supported by FISB are now, um, are now deploying that seal. I just wanted to show you, actually, which I thought was, I was really impressed with my funny answer, which is C. I don't know if any of you saw. That was, that was my laugh moment. You guys were supposed to get that, but anyway. Okay, pop quiz question number two. I think everybody here gave that one away, but which pop icon recently joined FISB in commemorating the 40th anniversary of the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act? Thanks. The reason why I put Bette Midler is when I was trying to come up, come up with some fake answers, I looked at this picture and I thought, that's sort of a Bette Midler hairdo, isn't it? The kind of updo that Cindy had at the event. Anyway, we were very pleased um, to have helped FISB put that together and I just wanted to, I know everybody's already talked about how, how great it was and these are the three young people that actually talked with Cindy at that event along with Risa and other folks but um, from that event we actually got uh, 800 tweets on the day of the event. We got live coverage from C-SPAN who recorded the whole thing. If you go on the C-SPAN website and you search youth homelessness, I think that stream will be up forever. Um, NBC News covered it, the Washington Post covered it. Um, we got a whole bunch of hits from around the country of different local media. It ran on NBC News in Chicago, I know, because uh, my mother-in-law saw it. And, um, and what the result was, was just, you know, in, in the biz they call them impressions, which means sort of the eyeballs that saw the, saw the stuff. So um, we know that there were millions, probably up, upwards of five million people. Um, what you, you guys may not know, some of you do, is that this was part of a larger campaign to end youth homelessness. It started in September and is running through actually the end of this month. 
One of the first things we did was we created a hashtag called Because of RHYA, and we asked all of you to upload um, stuff to your social media feeds, answering the question because of RHYA. And this one, I can't read it very well, but it's Larkin Street. Lark I don't know if Larkin is here, but yay! But <laughs> Larkin was just one of the people that actually participated in that with us. And there's, here is, <clears throat> because of RHYA, we have helped over 75,000 runaway and homeless youth move beyond the street and toward a brighter future. So um, we were, we were um, really excited that everybody sort of got engaged in that. Um, then at the beginning of October, in conjunction with our, um, the media event, we also asked people to start using the hashtag end youth homelessness. Um, and, that, and also take pictures with this end youth homelessness sign. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but um, I think we... Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, we, we have some signs out at our booth out in the front, so if you want to sign and you want to take a picture and you want to upload it, um, this, this has actually been really successful so far. We've had about 1,500 people uploading things to this hashtag, um, and I think, I can't, the latest statistics I think we got were something like 7 million people potentially might have seen um, this hashtag. So the more you use it and keep using it and keep using it and keep using it and keep using it, the more we're going to be able to really increase the visibility. It's a very simple message. Let's end youth homelessness. Um, we also issued a blogging challenge to people. It's the, you know, the, the 40th anniversary of the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act. We're trying to end youth homelessness. Write about it on your blog. Um, we reached out to a whole bunch of different people. So far we have 20, I think up close to 20, including the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Uh, the True Colors Fund has done some stuff. Some other people have, um, Huffington Post has done a couple blogs on ending youth homelessness. We need you guys to participate in this stuff. Sorry, I clicked the button. Um, th this kind of stuff is what raises the visibility. This is the kind of stuff that gets us to our goal of 2020 of ending youth homelessness. All right. This is my favorite one. Pop quiz question number three. At last year's conference, what did Associate Commissioner Bill Bentley promise to do if you did it too? Yeah, that's right. Although I really would like to see him do the limbo. But uh, the, a couple weeks ago, FISB launched the FISB Twitter feed. So please. I don't even know the language, like it or friend it or do whatever it is that you're supposed to do. Follow it. Thank you. Thank you. Joelle Rubin, who's my social media guru down here, is cringing for me right now. Exactly. Um, so uh, if you don't know what that means, go talk to Joelle. She's going to be out in the, in the hallway. But anyway, so this is, this is one more mechanism for, for FISB to communicate to you and to, uh, for you to communicate with FISB and for all of us together to collectively tell the story about how we're ending youth homelessness by 2020. And last one. How many news articles, research, and funding opportunities has NICFI published just for you since last November, since we were here in this, in a different room, but all gathered together? Answers? The answer is C. We have, we have published 313 things on our website. We write them all ourselves. We do them specifically for you in mind. We find funding opportunities specifically, specifically because we think that you might be able to apply for them. We look at research and we summarize it because we think it's important for you to know about that stuff. So please um, come visit our website. And there it is, uh, nickv.acf.hhs.gov. Um, and these are the different ways that you can join FISB and join us in um, our efforts to end in all of our efforts in this room and across the country to end youth homelessness by 2020. So let's use all of the communication vehicles in our power to start talking about this stuff so everybody knows. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Tammy. I am the Chief Strategic Initiatives Officer for our National Safe Place Network, and more important to you guys, I'm the Director of RITAC. And as I was trying to make the long way from that chair to here, um, I thought about being a youth care worker about 25 years ago, and back in the day when the kids, you know, the law enforcement would say, if you're so great, why do the kids run from the runaway shelter? And um, I was that staff person that would chase them down the street, right? And then, of course, I wasn't in better athletic shape than I am now. And so I would sit on the, you know, sidewalk and I'd be like, 
you know, you're going to feel so guilty if I die chasing you. <laughs> because I knew nothing about being trauma informed. <laughs> and they would come back, Miss Tammy, are you okay? We'll help you get back to the shelter. Okay. No, we can't stop for cigarettes on the way back, kids. Let's just, let's just do it. I'm, time's running out. So to uh, keep that frame in mind, let me give you a couple of updates about what we're doing with RITAC and what we hope to be doing with you in the, the next year. Um, certainly, we are charged with providing training and technical assistance to you. And because I come from the field, I understand the value of really good training and technical assistance. The problem is that you, tr you try to find something that looks like you, feels like you, sounds like you, represents what it is that you want to know. And that's hard because you go online and you look and you're desperate and you're, you're Googling and you're trying to find something. That's my agency. That's my program. That's my kids. And you find stuff that'd be like great for other agencies, but it doesn't really speak to you. And it's been one of the things that we've been really struggling with because when you're trying to help organizations in all 50 states and the um, you know, American territories, then you're like, man, you either do stuff for everybody and then it has to be mainstream generic, you know, this is what we already knew and what we've been doing for 40 years, or we kind of target in deep and let you tell us what do we need to know and, 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 and let us know how we can help you. And so talk about um, in a few minutes what we're going to try to do to be more helpful. You know, specifically, we've been doing lots of things. We've been doing recorded webinars and webinars that are posted to the e-learning site. How many of you guys have an e-learning subscription on RITAC? You know how to get to that. So for those of you who don't, you're missing out because all you have to do is be employed by a runaway and homeless youth grantee and you can go to the website and you get an e-learning subscription and you know how many of you guys work overnight or program shelters you know second third shifts anybody yeah they're all asleep at the pool all right good thank you <laughs> so you know so you get your subscription and even in those hours when they're like do something to try to stay away i mean do something engaging you can go online and you can take um, an e-learning course and print out a certificate and you know leave it in the box of your supervisor the next day said see i was awake um and and, and show them that you're actually doing things to help young people uh, 24 7. um we are launching um with FISB funding um national safe place network has a, a pair a paradigm a philosophy of dealing with human trafficking victims called HTR3, um, and it's human trafficking, and the R3 is recognize, respect, and respond. It is a total trauma-informed, strength-based way of approaching human trafficking victims and survivors. Uh, some of you will notice yourselves in the picture below. We, we did our first training of trainers. If I've got some human trafficking HTR3 uh, trainers in the room, can you guys please stand so that people can, can see who you guys are? Um, Risa, yes, you can stand up. Um, she's like, can I? Um, yes. Um, really, this particular curriculum is a human trafficking curriculum that was um, developed by RITAC under the leadership of, of Jim Bolas, for those of you who know Jim in the, in the field, um, to really look at specific human trafficking as it overlaps with runaway and homeless youth, specifically. So it's a good particular curriculum to get into your regions. There's a regional trainer in every region now. And so we can have them come out and do some work with you. We'll come out and do some work with you. So let us know if you're interested. We've also done some other training of trainers events. So demonstrating effectiveness, understanding evidence-based practice, um, trauma-informed care continues to be um, really popular. And, and really this last year we did, we went back to an old school training of trainers because, you know, it takes a lot to be able to keep people's attention um, and, you know, to, to kind of help them understand that what you have to say is important, even if the way you say it just kind of makes them angry. And so we brought together people and we said, you know, let's do this train of trainers and um, we're going to be able to, to get some of those in your regions as well. We've been doing Talk It Out Thursday. Um, and it's every Thursday at 3 p.m. It is really just a call. Get on the call, find out who's there, have a conversation. It's old school networking with a telephone. You can walk around if you need to, um, but it is a phone call. And, you know, I know a lot of you can't make it on Thursday. So if there's another day or time, I mean, we can do moaning Mondays and woeful Wednesdays. We can do whatever you want, but tell us this is the day and time that works better for us to have a conversation. Because I'll hear a lot of people say, I'd love to do Talk It Out Thursday. 
I just, I'm, I'm busy. I can't do it that day. Um, and it's great to have those people have a conversation. And, you know, I'm Joe in Michigan. I'm Sissy in Florida. I'm Caitlin in Oregon. And, you know, after they talk about the weather, they really get into talking about what's going on in their programs. Um, really want to kind of emphasize that through the website, there's calls, there's e emails, there's ways that you can connect with us. Here's the thing. If you need technical assistance, sometimes it's, it's hard not to see that as some kind of limitation, right? It's like when you call for help. It's like how many people call credit counseling and go, I've got things going great in my life, you know? Right? Well, we're not credit counseling. We don't see it when you call as a, ooh, let's write this program's name down because they're struggling. They're having a hard time. Because then you're afraid to call. You're afraid to connect. We don't do any of that. We just want you to call and say, you know, Tammy, it sucks. I don't know how to do this paperwork. Or, you know, Mark, can you help us with this training because we can't get it locally. Or TC, I don't understand what this memo means. And we will walk you through it. I mean, that's the stuff that we love to do and we want to be able to do it with you. We started a couple of new projects that are looking at culture of care. How many of you were at the TLP grantees meeting? Um, in the, uh, a few of you were there. Um, we had, um, we've got a great partnership with the University of Tennessee. And they've done about 30 years worth of work that says, you know what the biggest indicator of positive outcomes are for your young people? Anybody have a guess? Biggest indicator of positive outcomes for our kids. What? Relationships. And you know what damages those and, and damages the outcomes that we have for our programs the most? You guys not getting along as staff people. What we do and how we do it in our own organizations. We can throw every evidence-based, every curricula, every program, but if as a staff we're not working together as teams and getting along and working toward the same goal, the kids notice, they don't like it, they don't stay, there go the outcomes. And so they've done 30 years of work with this, and so we're going to dive deep and get some information out to you guys in the coming year. And we've also been working a lot around sustainability, and you're going to see some tip sheets coming out. We've got a fantastic advisory board. Our advisory board represents all of the federal regions. These are volunteers from grantee organizations who say, you know what, we're going to help. We're going to yield our voice, our expertise, our time to kind of represent you guys. I know that I've got some advisory board members in the room. Can you guys stand up for me? Um, yes, there you guys are. Seriously, they're not all white. This is crazy. Um, I, yeah, at least go outside for a while because this is uh, embarrassing. Um, yeah, there's, there's 20, there's 20, it's a, it's a diverse group, not only in terms of um, what they bring to the table, but who they are and the way they think about programs and being rural and urban and host home and shelter and, and really trying to hash out what are the best things for runaway and homeless youth in our um, communities. And it's pretty important to, to recognize that in the spring of this year, we're going to be putting out an all call for new advisory board members. And so if you would like to be considered to join the advisory board, I'm going to encourage you to watch the website for that. Um, we have also a um, couple of things coming up 2015. We are going to have the TLP grantees meeting. Do not have data about that yet. Typically, TLPs is connected to pathways. Um, there's some changes going on around pathways, so we don't know yet what TLP is going to be like. We're going to hopefully be able to communicate with you guys about that. We are going to repeat the Street Outreach Grantees meeting, the first one that was held uh, this past September. It will be earlier in the year, uh, but it will be for Street Outreach Grantees, and it's going to be a partnership between uh, RITAC, um, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and Polaris, and it's going to specifically focus on technology and um, the, the use of the Internet to, to lure uh, young people, so um, hopefully that will be of interest to you. We've got some fantastic partnerships with state, uh, regional, and national providers. And one of the things we learned is you can't do it by yourself. I don't care where your office is. If you're not working with people who do it locally, you're missing the boat. 
So programs like many, um, the California Coalition for Youth, um, you know, there's just so many, the Indiana uh, Youth Services Association, there's all of these organizations that have partnered with us to say, you know, hey, we want to represent the people that we work with and, and partner with you. And so I want to thank all of those partners. And, and, and you know, lastly, we're going to try things a little bit differently in 2015. We're calling them uh, RITAC pickups. Um, not because I'm a redneck from Tennessee, but because, um, well, you know, it's what it is. I'm not going to sing Rocky Top. Um, yeah, right. Um, yeah, TC, who's an Alabama person, she's always talking about Roll Tide and like, I, you know, her fascination with laundry detergent just, um, <laughs> it, it baffles me. Um, but anyway, here's the deal. You guys talk to each other more than you talk to us. So you guys are talking around these tables now. When you guys go to your regional project officer meetings next, you guys are all from the same geographic location, theoretically, if you find the right room. Um, and so if you're in the room and you're having a conversation and it's like, hey, there's six of us from Georgia, and you know what? We really like to have some training on this. Here's the pickup. You pick a topic, you pick a date, you pick a place, and you call us and we will show up. Okay? So it's about you guys telling us what it is that we need. Because if we show up, we can put a date on the calendar. We can say, oh, we're doing, you know, case management in Philadelphia. No offense against Philadelphia. It's a fine city. Uh, a lot of cracked bells. But you show up in Philadelphia, and if you guys can't get there or you're not interested in case management, then it's a waste of the taxpayer dollars and it's a waste of our time. So you tell us. You let us know what you need, and we're going to be there for you. So how do you connect with us? It's there. We're also all around tonight dancing. We got everything from Rufus to Ohio Players to The Hustle to Snoop. Everybody come. Everybody dance. Um, I will also say that for those of you who are staying at a satellite hotel, who is not staying at this hotel? All right. We do not want you to feel left out. So come to the reception. Have a good time. Find a buddy and make your way to the lobby, and when you're ready to go, we'll set some times up, and, and, and you know, we all got some rental cars, but we will get you home, okay? So, so we want you to be here, okay? All right, thanks. Thank you, Tammy. Hello, everybody. I'm Gordon Vance from the National Runaway Safe Line, and I appreciate this opportunity to talk a little bit about the activities of the National Runaway Safe Line and our part of the continuum to run away homeless, at risk youth and their families. So, we have a couple bullet points that I'm going to run through. Obviously, it's National Runaway Prevention Month, and uh, people have gotten a lot of information on that, so I don't have a lot to add, except it's been nice being here for the last couple of days and having people come up and talk about the activities that they're doing in their community to, array, to raise awareness of runaway homeless youth. We've done a lot of stuff around green lights and socks and stuff, and people have done cool stuff and really appreciate that. We hope they can share that with us and so we can share that with our social media stuff. Um, and then there's more activities on Tuesday evening here, the candlelight obs are, uh, the candlelight activity and the 40 year anniversary. Um, we're also in the middle of rewriting our Let's Talk Runaway Prevention Curriculum. How many people have used our Runaway Prevention Curriculum? Lots of folks. So it's time to write it. We were fortunate enough to pull together some private funding to get that done. And we're going to base it upon our already evidence based. Um, foundation to that program and the neat thing about it is we're really using your feedback that you have provided us over the years people who have submitted pre and post test data other feedback facilitators and stuff it's all being worked into there boiled down pilot tested and we look to have that out oh, about July so it'll be on our website and such as that and we're in the middle of changing hardware and software too we're transitioning to a new call center type MIS program have some of the same pains that we talked about with this HIMS program but we're really looking forward to it it's exciting it unifies our online and call center operations into one type of a screen makes it easier to manage it improves our ability to manage our 10,000 resources on our database push those resources through chats and texts and online communications to youth and families in crisis. It also um, 
increases our ability to streamline data and to track data, report data, and also track our own staff training and continuing um, education programs, of which we use a lot of RITAX online activities. So we're excited about that. We're rebuilding our website. Lots of technical stuff happened at the same time, but we're really looking to improve it across platforms, so all the mobile devices, phones, um, tablets, PCs, and who knows how soon those Apple Watches will be out and Google Glasses will be out, but you have to kind of build it thinking the future's coming because the future came really quick in technology terms. It's going to be very intuitive and it's going to be a, a provide ability for people to access all of our services through the website. And for you folks who call us a lot seeking our data, call activity data and outcome and such, that'll be on there. It'll be improved as our other resources. Um, we're expanding our work in social media. We certainly do a lot of it, but I just want to share that our online contacts through chat, text, emails, and bulletins really have been increasing about 30 to 40 percent a year. And in that, we've also seen probably a 2, 3, 4 percent decline in calls. And with it has been some interesting stuff. As we added online services in the last two or three years, the average age of the contact has dropped a year and a half, two years. Now we're talking to more kids that are 12, 13, 14, and they're talking about the same crisis that those kids that were 15, 16, 17 you know, used to talk about. They're thinking about running away, they need support, families need support, parents need support. So it's, it's a whole new world, it's a whole new population, and we're getting a handle on it. And some of the additions in technology is, is going to help improve that. So our calls actually are kind of now being dominated by youth 18, 19, and 20, more homeless, throwaway youth and such like that, seeking different types of services. But overall, we're actually connect, uh, connected with more youth now than ever. Um, Thanksgiving dinner. This is actually our activity that's part of National Runaway Prevention Month. This is the 15th year that we've done it. It's a place where we get our batteries recharged. We throw a dinner for about 95 RHY youth in Chicago. And we do this by acquiring donations for food, and we have some people underwriting. And actually, the Chicago Cubs have underwritten it for the last couple of years. And we collaborate with a local church and have a huge dinner. There's usually about 130, 140 people there, and it's an exciting time. It's something we encourage people to do as, as part of their stuff. So it makes us feel better. Always kicks off my holidays, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Um, let me click on Oh, I'm not supposed to be a question. Just wanted to add two more quick things. So NRS has a workshop on Wednesday. It's NRS, what we do and how we do it. I'm fortunate this year to have Jennifer Dean Ocola, my call center manager, and actually just my right-hand person. She's been with me probably 14 or 15 years. So she'll be there. So if you have more questions about our, our programs and services or where we're going or where we've been, please stop by there, our workshop, or out at our, um, out at our table out there. The workshop's going to focus on not only our services, but really on that home free program. I know you've heard me talk a lot about the capacity there is endless. Greyhound has been just angels providing tickets for that program, and you folks have been wonderful in using it, but there's more room. SOP programs, basic center programs can do it. You know, we send home about 500 kids a year in that program, and as I look around the room, that's about how many people are in this room right now. So it's exciting, it's something that we can even do more of, and we certainly want to thank your participation in that. And lastly, I always appreciate the opportunity to be up here and to thank you all personally for being available and taking our calls morning, noon, and night. Because we know when we call you and we say it's the National Runaway Safe Line, do you have a bed? The next thing's going to happen is we're going to put this kid on the phone in a conference call and we're going to talk about that bed, your rules, your expectations, what they're concerned about. But we're going to empower that youth and you guys just pick it right up. You just pick it right up there in the middle of the crisis with us and work toward a positive solution and we cannot say thank you enough about that to you and to the people that you have back in your offices and your programs. Thank you. Okay, so someone just handed me a note. Someone lost some car keys. Um, do you have the car keys? No, no, I, I, I lost. Oh, you lost some car keys. So if anyone finds car keys, because this gentleman needs to, needs to get home, so please turn it in either to, um, I'm going to say RITAC, so at the, or the front desk. 
Um, I just want to say, I know we've gone over time, so we really appreciate your attention this afternoon. Um, if you look on page five in your, in your agenda booklet, that's, it has the information in terms of where you would meet with your federal project officer. And so by state, page 25. And the other thing that I want to say is if anyone still has any questions of us, we're going to be here for a few minutes. So feel free, I, we don't have time for questions. But feel free, please feel free to come up and ask any questions that you may have. And thanks again for your time.